Greetings and welcome. We are in 303 and we turn now in your junior anthology to page 692 and following. The historical background for what your textbook company will call, put it in your notes, the modern age. The modern age. And you'll see the dates. 1914 to 1945. Now this is going to be problematic, this use of the term modern, okay? Because people were using this term long before 1914. But no doubt, 1914 we start to use the term modern, but then the obvious question is, well what do you call the period after 1945? If that's the modern period up to 45, what do you call the, fo the period to follow? And most academics call it the postmodern period, okay? Of course, the problem with calling it postmodern is, well, how long does postmodern last before we have to go to another title? And believe it or not, that title is usually post-postmodern. Seriously? Are we going to get to like three posts and then modern? You see what I'm saying? That, that's the funny thing about these, about these terms. The other thing I would say, and I would put this in my notes as well, these terms like modern period are terms that are applied usually after the fact. In other words, looking backwards. That is usually the case, but I should point out that the people living in 1914 and on somehow had a sense that they were living in a new time, a modern age. Let's read along now on 692 and following. And all you need to do is just read along with me, practice your fluency by trying to stay up again, as we've said many times, Take that pencil or that pen um, uh, tip and try and follow with the words as I read it with you. And we'll pause momentarily and obviously take a few notes. This stuff obviously is going to end up on the exam and will be a part of our lectures here coming. So let's pay attention to it. The historical background, the modern age, 1914 to 1945. The years immediately before World War I were marked by practical optimism. Americans believed they had grown up and looked at themselves realistically. Technological know-how made the future look bright. Social problems could be solved. However, World War I shattered American and European values. The war not only remade governments and borders, it made people all over the world rethink what it meant to be a human being. Let's begin, first of all, with the Great War. And by the way, I've often said this, dude, you don't call it World War I until you have World War II. They did not call World War I World War I. It gets called World War I only when you have what? World War II. Well, then what was it called? Believe it or not, it was called the Great War, right? The World War, right? World War I was one of the bloodiest and most tragic conflicts ever to occur. The Allies, primarily Britain, France, and Russia, halted the German advances, but both sides dug trenches and brought the war to a standstill. Machine guns made it impossible to overrun the opponent. Almost an entire generation of European men wasted away. President Woodrow Wilson tried to remain neutral, but that proved impossible. Eventually, Unrelenting German submarine attacks swayed public opinion, and in 1917, the United States joined the Allies. American confidence passed quickly. The horrors of combat were unspeakable, intensified by new technology put to wartime use. This was the dark side of the modern age. Europeans and Americans had turned the world into a wasteland. As one soldier poet put it, I have a rendezvous with death. The Roaring Twenties. The war ended in 1918, but people's minds and hearts were not at peace. Throughout the Twenties, the nation seemed to go on a binge. The economy boomed and skyscrapers rose. Prohibition made the sale of liquor illegal, leading to bootlegging and the rise of organized crime. Radio arrived and so did jazz. Movies became big business and fads abounded. Raccoon coats, flagpole sitting, a dance called the Charleston. People let go as pre-war values and attitudes were thrown to the winds. The roar of the Roaring Twenties tried to drown out the remembered sound of exploding bombs and the horror of death. Let's just pause for a moment and put it in our notes. You have this really fascinating thing that happens. 
where you have the first war, the great war, and terrible things happen. And immediately following the war, you have this time period where people try to forget the horrors of the war. And there's tremendous economic growth. So for example, when we study Fitzgerald and the Great Gatsby, we will look at a time period called the Roaring Twenties where people partied like there was absolutely no tomorrow. And the idea of partying as a social function and people go to parties and they just get blitzed and it's, you know, it's kind of accepted is, is understood in better context when you look at the terrors of the First World War and the horrible things that had happened. And all of the people who lost somebody, it seemed like everybody on the planet was affected by somebody they lost in their, in their extended family. And of course, whole families were destroyed in the First World War. Ironically, after you, you have the war, then you have this terrible time, of, or, or this uh, amazing time of partying and everything, followed then by, on page 693, the Great Depression. So let's put it in our notes. History has this interesting kind of like pendulum effect, right? Where there's this unbelievable optimism. Yay, everything's going to be great at the beginning of the century. 14 years into it, you have the terrible war. And everything goes, eh. Then as soon as the war is over in 1918, you have this, yay, we're finished with the war, let's have a good time. And economic markets start to boom, and everybody starts making money, and everybody starts having a good time. And then all of a sudden, the crash. Of course, the crash leads to the Great Depression. Let's read about it. The boom, of course, couldn't last. In October of 1929, and by the way, these are dates that I hope you're putting in your notes. October of 1929, the stock market crashed, spurring the Great Depression. By mid-1932, are you ready for this? About 12 million Americans, one quarter of the workforce, were out of work. Nobody had any work. Bread lines formed, soup kitchens opened, depression became more than an economic fact, it became a national state of mind. I had a student once who said, dude, I totally know about this, because I was visiting, uh, when I was a little boy, visiting my great grandma, and um, I was at breakfast, and I poured some sugar on my cereal, and then I just dumped, you know, accidentally off the bowl on the table, and I went, and I blew this, you know, just blew the sugar, and my great grandma just jumped up and she said no don't no and she started trying to scoop all of the sugar together and I was like what what it's just sugar and she said no when I was a little girl you only got just a few grains of sugar as on your whatever your cereal or whatever because it was really expensive because I grew up in the Great Depression and my students said that was the first time I ever understood Oh, so they must look at us, the students said, they must look at us as kind of really spoiled brats because we just get rid of stuff all the time and it doesn't even occur to us. There was a time when it was really, really bad. That's the Great Depression. Of course, let's put a point here in our notes, leadership in America is often defined by responding to terrible events. And of course, you have one of America's most famous presidents, many people debate whether he was great or really not that great, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who will come to prominence because of this terrible depression. The New Deal, in the presidential election of 1932, New York's Governor Franklin D. Roosevelt defeated President Herbert Hoover. Roosevelt initiated the New Deal a package of major economic reforms to strengthen the economy. People found work on huge public projects such as building dams and bridges. Roosevelt's leadership and policies helped end the Depression and earned him re-election in 1936, 1940, 1944. Of course, this is an amazing fact, right, that he would be the president for so long. Then, right when it looks like, whew, dodge that bullet, got out of the Great Depression and everything's going to be okay. <clears throat> Second World War. Of course, it will be the Second World War that will then lead to us calling the First, the Great War, the First World War. World War II. Are you ready for this? Only 20 years after the end of World War I, <clears throat> the German invasion of Poland initiated World War II. <clears throat> Even after the fall of France in 1940, the dominant mood in the United States was one of isolationism, with most Americans preferring to stay out of the conflict. Now, let's put that word in our notes, 
isolationism. What that word means is people in America did not want to have to go to another war. They had had enough of war in World War I, right? There were so many people, right, who were reminded of how terrible that war was. And they were like, dude, we do not want to have anything to do with the war. Whatever happens, keep us out of the war. All right? Well, you know, you know the story, right? Let's, let's read it and, and we'll kind of see how, how things go, okay? Even after the fall of France in 1940, the dominant mood in the United States was one of isolationism, with most Americans preferring to stay out of the conflict. However, I hope you're reading with me now. However, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii on December 7th, 1941, Right? That's an important date for your notes. Isolationism and neutrality came to a swift end. The United States declared war on the Axis powers, Germany, Japan, and Italy. After years of bitter fighting in Europe and in the Pacific, the Allies, which included the United States, Great Britain, France, and the Soviet Union, defeated Nazi Germany. Japan surrendered three months later after the United States dropped the atomic bombs on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Peace and the atomic age had arrived. The uh, textbook here, the company, will give you several key historical themes, war and its aftermath. Look at these bullet points really quickly on 693. After the shock of World War I, Americans left behind many of the optimistic attitudes and humane values of the pre-war world. During the Roaring Twenties, Americans gave way to self-indulgence. During the Thirties, they endured intense economic hardship. And finally, World War II ushered in the atomic age, and of course what we will call later the Cold War, as opposed to a hot war, right? Okay, let's turn now to 694, and of course you're seeing along the bottom of 692, 693, and the following, the timeline and some of the pictures that are involved there as well. On 694, let's go to it. Essential questions across time. The modern age again, 1914, 1945. And the question here is, what is the relationship between literature and plays? Let's take a look at some of these uh, questions and observations. What American places especially affected American life in the first half of the 20th century? Of course, the answer first is cities. Immigration, land development and technological advances in telephones, building materials, power generators, and cars turned towns into cities and cities into metropolises. Big business thrived, and the 20s roared on city streets and in downtown hotspots. However, City life also came to mean crowding, poverty, crime, racism, and anonymity. In other words, you could do things and nobody knows who you are, so it's easier to get away with them. Towns and farms is your next heading. Small town America changed too, especially after World War I. A popular 1919 song asks, how are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? In other words, once they've gone off and seen the world, how do you keep them back living in a small town like Worland, for example? Town populations shrank. Many traditions became the subjects of nostalgia. Farmers suffered terribly in the 1930s when severe drought turned the Great Plains into the Dust Bowl. Look at the next question. What non-American places especially affected American life in the first half of the 20th century? Your topic, heading, battlefields and boulevards. The trenches that scarred Europe's landscape also scarred Americans' minds, undercutting cherished beliefs such as the nobility of Western culture. On the other hand, the artistic life that flourished in the studios and cafes of Paris pushed Americans into the modern age. The battlefields of World War II, including Hiroshima, would leave their indelible marks on both the American psyche and its politics. Notice your essential vocabulary, voc um, question vocabulary there. The words development, metropolis, and anonymity, right? These will all end up on the exam, so obviously you want to put those in your, uh, you know, put those in your notes. 695, the next question. How do these places show up in the work of modern American writers? Let's talk about Paris and modernism for a second. After World War I, disenchantment led some American writers to become expatriates. I would put that word in my notes or exiles. It means people who left America to live somewhere else for the rest of their life. Many went to Paris where they gathered at the home of Gertrude Stein, the writer who dubbed them the Lost Generation. It's a famous title. 
Ezra Pound, here's, here's a list of some amazing writers. Ezra Pound, Ernest Hemingway, F. Scott Fitzgerald, E.E. E. Cummings, Sherwood Anderson, and other modernist writers, painters, and musicians created a vibrant cultural life in Paris and gave American writing a dynamic European awareness it had never had before. Our next topic, urban wastelands. T.S. Eliot, born in St. Louis, went to Europe in 1914 and settled in England. Eliot's poem, many call it the most famous poem of the 20th century, The Wasteland, right down the date, 1922, using imagery of a fog-shrouded, unreal city, summed up the sterility of the post-war world. In a different way, the glittering city dwellers who populated the fiction of Escott Fitzgerald faced their own delusionism and emptiness. We know about this when we read Great Gatsby. The next topic, the Harlem Renaissance. A new literary age also dawned in northern Manhattan in Harlem. Conti Cullen, Langston Hughes, Claude McKay, Jean Toomer, Arna uh, um, Bontrips, and Zora Neale Hurston produced prose and poetry that expressed the African-American experience. They also captured the sights, sounds, and emotions of modern urban life. Towns, farms, and plains. In sharply satiric novels, Sinclair Lewis took aim at small town life, particularly in the Midwest. John Steinbeck portrayed the struggles of men and women who work the land, particularly in California and the Southwest. Eudora Welty and William Faulkner used the landscapes of Mississippi in tragic comedy tales of family, race, life, and death in the South. Let's look at, on page 695, that box there that says the American experience close up on history, women get the vote. Let's pay attention to this. This is going to be another major topic for us. The passage of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution giving women the right to vote was a landmark in American social history. The struggle to grant women the right to vote, or suffrage, went back many years, but it gathered momentum in the early 1900s. Carrie Chapman Catt organized the state-by-state -state campaign, and year by year, more states in the West and Midwest granted women suffrage, although mostly only in state elections. Gradually, more women called for a voice in national elections, too. Beginning in 1913, President Woodrow Wilson met with suffragists led by Alice Paul. Wilson, however, did not support a constitutional amendment, and in 1917, suffragists picketed the White House. After several months, police began arresting the protesters. Paul and others went on a hunger strike, but prison officials force-fed them. Upon the release, they resumed picketing. By early 1918, the tide began to turn. The tireless work of Cat, Paul, and others began to pay off. President Wilson gave his support, and in 1919, Congress passed the 19th Amendment. By August 1920, three-fourths of the states had ratified it. The amendment doubled the number of eligible voters in the United States and eliminated a long-standing injustice. It sometimes blows the minds of my students that it took so long for women to be given the right to vote. And of course, you live in a state, Wyoming, called actually the Equality State for this very reason, right? All right, let's look at 696. The next question, how does literature shape or reflect society? And then the next question, what major social and political events affected American writers in the first half of the 20th century? Let's read. The major events listed below affected how writers thought about themselves and the world and shaped many of the themes of the age. For example, World War I, the shock and devastation made it clear that a new world, radically different from the past, would have to be created. With the next bullet point, the Depression and the New Deal, poverty was everywhere. But jobs with the Work Projects Administration, WPA, enabled many writers to survive. The third bullet point, World War II, the atomic bomb, the Holocaust. The full effects of these horrors would only become more apparent as the century wore on. Look at the next question. What values, attitudes, and ideas grew from these events? First bullet point, disillusionment with old ideas and ideals the ideas and ideals of the 19th century had failed. They had not prevented the slaughter of World War I, and so new beliefs and attitudes had to take their place. 
wider cultural awareness. Wars and new technologies made Americans more aware of other cultures and other artistic traditions. Greater democratization. The middle class continued to expand. Women, African Americans, and immigrants from many countries played increasingly important roles in American cultural life. Fragmentation of experience. War, the stresses of modern urban life, and the sheer speed of change enmeshed many people in feelings of uncertainty, imbalance, and a sense of discontinuity. We're going to use a term later, alienation. You don't feel like you fit in anymore. Notice the next question. How were these forces expressed in literature? First heading, out with the old. Above all, modernism was a desire for the new. Modernist writers experimented with new approaches and techniques. They were out to capture the essence of modern life in both the content and form of their work. Modernists looked for new solutions. The old ways of telling stories in a straight narrative line from beginning to middle to end were out. The old ways of presenting poetry in repeating meters and rhyme schemes were out. In general, the new approaches demanded more from readers than earlier works. The next heading, a global vision. Windows had been opened to the rest of the world. The art of China, Japan, Africa, India, ancient Greece, medieval Italy, Italy, provincial France, all contributed to the mix that became modernism. The next heading, more writers. Women had always played a role in American literary life, but in the 20th century, they became more central than ever. Gertrude Stein shaped modernist values, and Harriet Monroe, the editor of Poetry Magazine, championed its verse. With the Harlem Renaissance, African-American writers such as Langston Hughes stepped into the limelight, paving the way for generations of African-American writers to follow. The next heading, Literature and Pieces. In previous eras, writers felt obligated to the literary rules and authors who had preceded them. With the onset of